Thank you again. Again, I want to bring you greetings in the name of uh, our church, also first to my family. I'm just very encouraged by uh, uh, just the work that the God is doing in Central Valley. I came only for two years, uh, almost ten, more than 10 years ago, to this church in Central Valley. That's where my wife grew up. And uh, we came to the church only with the desire to stay there for two years. That was our agreement. And I really wanted to go back to Romania. That was my heart, where my heart was, still is. And uh, three years and a half into our time, more than I wanted to stay there, I went to the elders of my wife and said, uh, guys, thank you very much. I really appreciate our time here, but I really want your blessing to go back to Romania. And um, by God's grace, um, they uh, prayed and came back and they said, hey, you know what? Uh, we, we praise God for your desire to go, but we think you are more um, useful to God uh, while you are here. And... Um, and we prayed about that. Uh, we took like three months to pray, and they invited me to, to do the preaching ministry and the vision discipleship for Trinity Community Church in Fresno, California. So uh, we've been there now. This is my 11th year, and God has been just being very kind and gracious to our church. Uh, as I said, I brought some uh, folks with me today. Uh, that's also, also because we have a wedding that I was, uh, I'm supposed to perform tomorrow. Uh, weddings are not normally on, on Mondays, but this is the only time when they can find a place for this venue. And this couple really wanted me to be there. So that's what uh, brought us down here. And this uh, sweet couple, uh, Cameron and Jamie. Cameron is one of our elders. Jamie uh, leads the women's uh, ministry in our church. Um, that is pretty large. We have a, a really blessed ministry there, and we praise God for that. This morning, I wanted to um, talk to you about a very important topic, and I wanted to start with a question before we get into God's Word. I wanted to ask you a very simple, but I think it's a very important question. What do you think it's God's purpose with you in this life? Let me say that again. What do you think it's God's purpose with you in this life? The way you answer this question is important because it defines, you know, how we live our lives, how you live our life. And I hope you know that God's purpose for your life is greater than find a better country here on this earth. Come to America, have a good job, have the money that you didn't have when you were younger. And to give to, those, to your kids, I hope you know that God's purpose with your life is bigger than just to ha have a nice family, have a nice career, or your kids to have a nice family and a nice career. I hope you know that God's purpose with our lives is even greater than coming here on a regular basis and, and, and sing songs and, and say poems and, and play in the orchestra. God wants us to know him and enjoy him on a regular basis. That's the Westminster uh, Shorter Catechism uh, answer to the first question. What is the chief end of man? What is your purpose in this world? Brother and sister, dear friend, why do you think God puts you on this planet? And the Bible says that his purpose for you and I regardless of your background, is to know God and enjoy Him forever and share this with the rest of the world. That's why we gather on a regular basis. We gather as a church so that we can know God more, so that we can exalt in Christ more, so that we can be more mature in Christ, we can equip each other to be more like Jesus and when we live when we get out of here, we live out Christ wherever we go. A few years ago, I remember we sat down with our elders. We had this building project. And I, I remember gathering all the elders together. And I had this question for them. I said, brothers, why are we here for? What are we doing? Why should people come to our church? And why are we even here? Why are we gather on a Sunday morning? And we went through the scriptures and I said, we don't want to take what Saddleback Church does. We don't want to look at what Max Lucado or whatever other people out there do or John MacArthur. We have to go to the scriptures. We have to go to God's word. What's the purpose of the local church? Why are we here? Yes, we want to make disciples. But how can you make disciples if you are not a disciple of Christ yourself? So this morning what I want to do with you is to go back to one of the principal texts or essential texts in the book of Ephesians. 
And I was told that uh, Val at least, was doing some, some studies with the youth. And I want to emphasize not only what's the goal of God with our church in Fresno, but what's God's purpose with your church and you individually here in L.A. So if you have a Bible, please open God's word with me in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 to 16. And if you don't mind, let's stand. And after the reading of God's word, I will ask one of the brothers to, to lead us in a prayer. I'll read from NASB. And again, you have both the translations there. So uh, you can follow along. Listen to God's word. And he, meaning Jesus, gave some as apostles and some as prophets and some as evangelists and some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of service. To the building up of the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and on the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. As a result... We are no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness in deceitful scheme. But speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building, building up of itself in love. Let's pray. Father, we praise you for your goodness to us this morning. We thank you for the truth of your word. We thank you that your church is the pillar and support of the truth. Amen. We praise you for the gospel of Jesus Christ, where you pursue us, Lord. You bring us to you. You rescue us from our sin, from death. You bring us into a relationship with you in which we can enjoy you forever. We pray for the teaching of your word this morning. Prepare our hearts to hear it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. You may be seated. So before I jump into this passage, I want to give you a little background of, of this passage here, contextual-wise. Uh, if you read the book of Ephesians, and actually, by the way, every book that Paul writes, the first one or two or three chapters in that book, he takes time to remind the Christians the gospel. Nathan apparently talked about that this morning. He wanted us to remember the gospel. Why is that? And why does Paul remind the Christians of the gospel? Wouldn't the Christian know about the gospel? Isn't that the way you become a Christian? Yes, but here's the problem. Sometimes we take the gospel for granted. We forget the beauty of God's grace in our lives. We forget how undeserving we are of His mercy. We forget that that's the engine to keep us going. The gospel is not just the entryway into God's kingdom. It's the engine that keeps us going on a regular basis. The reason why I can love my wife as Christ loved the church is because of the gospel. The, the reason why women can submit to their husbands as the church submits to Christ is because of the gospel. The reason why parents should treat their children well into the Lord is because of the gospel. The, the reason why children could ever submit to their parents as Christ tells them to do is because of the gospel. The reason why you can do anything in this world is because of the gospel. And, and Paul takes time every time he writes a letter to remind the church about the gospel. And then in chapter 4, there is a transition. And in Romania, it makes more sense because uh, we talk from indicatives to imperatives. The ones you learn that in grammar in Romania, you know what imperative stands for, indicative stands for. In English, they took that out from school, unfortunately. What I mean by that, the first three chapters are just indicatives, meaning are, here's your state. They're, they're, they're statements that, that, that Paul makes that Christ has done in people's lives. You used to be dead in your sins. You weren't just a little bit asleep. You were dead in your sins and trespasses, meaning you were separated from God. There was no connection between you and God. Not because God did not want to get close to you. It's just because, because of sin. You're totally infected by sin. God cannot stay in your presence. And God made a way, the Bible says in, in, in Ephesians chapter four, 2, verse 4, after he says that you were dead in your sins and trespasses, but God, who is rich in mercy, he made a way 
to send his son to live the life that you and I cannot live, to die on the cross, the death that you and I deserve, and to resurrect the third day, all of this out of grace. And his resurrection proves that his promises are true. So Paul spends time in that. And then in chapter 4, he moves to, so what? Here's what you need to do. In light of who you are, this is what you need to do. So that's how he starts in chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called. Brothers and sisters, God called you to be his ambassador, to be his son, his daughter. He gave you a new identity. And we live in a very weird world where, where people don't know who they are anymore. Especially the younger people, there's a lot of confusion. And I tell them in the Colorado camp, we talked about how God made male and women and female. God is not confused on who you are. And if you're a Christian, the Bible says that you are his daughter and his son. And in light of this truth, you need to live out the gospel. You need to live out as a child of God. You are not a, a person anymore who's out there uh, orphan. You are a daughter and a son of God. That's what he says. And he says, in light of that, live as believer. With all humility, gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, diligent to preserve. By the way, tolerance is in the body of Christ. So it means more compassion, be thoughtful, be diligent to preserve the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body, one spirit, just as also you were called in one hope of your calling you need to be have unity surrounded around the gospel and its main biblical truths so this is where we pick up in verse 11 with this in mind and because it says there christ is the one who gave us or the church apostles some prophets some evangelists some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of service now here's what i want you to see god saved us he put us in a body of believers, and we are not all alike, are we? Sometimes we like to have everyone like us, but that's not God's design. And actually, if you go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, in the uh, analogy that Paul uses for a body, you'll see that he says we have different members. One of us are hands, some of us are ears, some of us are feet. Now sometimes the nose doesn't like how the feet are smelling. Sometimes the hands don't like where the feet are going. But we, God puts us together to sharpen us, to equip us, to polish us. He puts us in a body for a reason. And he says you need to be united not around your same preferences, but be right, united around the gospel. Be united around the gospel. Don't forget that. They cannot be all like you. They actually shouldn't be all like you. They shouldn't all be like me. We are diverse, but we are united. We are conforming to the, to the image of Christ, not to the image of Andre or to Frater Daniel or Frater Doro. We are conforming to Christ. So he says here, God gave those gifts, and he says, apostles, prophets. By the way, these are just few of the gifts of the Spirit. There's at least 19 other ones in 1 Corinthians 12, if you want to read that at home, uh, Romans 12, 1 Peter 4, 11, you see that there's other gifts. Here specifically, talks about these guys who are called primarily for the equipping of the body. So you see there, apostles, prophets, by the way, the way that the wording here is, I think has to do more with apostles that were once for all and never, before, never after. Uh, the 12 apostles, that's what I think it talks about here. The ones who lay the foundation for the church, hence the prophets. And then he goes on to talk about evangelists, pastors and teachers. People who are supposed to help the church. By the way, I want you to, to see this. That there's people who have the gift of evangelism more than, than all of us are called to do evangelism. But some of us are gifted this way. I, I know some people in our church that, that love to do this. We have a lady that goes to this gym or gyms in town and in the parking lot, she goes and, and gives flyers away. And we have a bunch of people who came to Trinity because of her desire to share the gospel. And she does it all, the, all day long. That, that's her heart. 
Now we have guys like Billy Graham who have the gift of evangelism before, beyond us. But they are meant to, interesting enough, to equip the church. They're not just meant to do their own thing. Then he goes on, pastors and teachers. Interesting, this word seems to be coming together. Some people think that the pastors are only good at shepherding. No, you need to be good at shepherding and at teaching. But if you're just have a teacher without shepherding, that's not good either, is it? You need to smell like sheep. That's what I was taught in seminary. And by the way, that's something that you cannot really learn from school. You need to be among people. God has to give you a heart for that. Some people, some pastors, they like the pulpit only, pulpiteers. And they put perfume of shepherds on them. But people, sheep smell that, don't they? When they try to use analogies on this and that, it doesn't work. You need to be among your sheep. That's one of the things we say to our, our congregation or to our staff. You need to be among the sheep. You need to have regular meetings and do preventive work, not firefighting work. You need to go out on lunch. We have budgets for lunch, for breakfast. We said, I said to them, I said, hey, if you are here during uh, lunch hours in our office, then that's a problem. You, you need to be out and about, meeting with people. What should I talk with them about? Talk with them about Jesus. See how they're doing. Ask them about their life. Ask them how can you pray for them. How can you come alongside them? But what's the goal of all this? Why do we, why did Christ give to the church? Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. What does he say here? The ultimate goal of all the equipping is spiritual maturity. Listen to verse 12 again. This is very important here. For the equipping of the saints, for the work of service, for the building up of the body of Christ. Until when? Until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. Our goal, brothers and sisters, dear friends, is to be mature in Christ. Mature in Christ. And that's a little bit different than being mature. Mature in Christ means and have a knowledge of Christ. Actually, the word here in Greek, it has this idea of wholeness. Something that is perfect, complete. Listen to Scottish, uh, a Scottish theologian that I really like, Singler Ferguson. He wrote a book by the name Maturity. And listen to what he says. The word maturity could describe a person who reached a high level of competence as a doctor or a teacher. In this sense, it meant someone whose powers and talents have been fully developed. It could mean complete or finished in the sense that we might speak of someone exhibiting workmanship of high quality or someone whose character was mature and well-rounded. So he or she is someone in whom God's recreating purposes are clearly illustrated, a person who expresses the true qualities of the servant of the Lord. Let me ask you, are you a mature believer? I'm not asking you how many years you've been a Christian for. I'm asking you, are you a mature believer? And, and if you have trouble identifying this, he actually goes on and I, he gives you some ways in which you can identify and even you can self-evaluate. Listen to verse 13 again. He says, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. How do you know if you're immature? Are you Christ-like? Are you Christ-like? The ultimate picture of maturity is Christ. That's who we should be. Jesus says, or John says, if you say you know Christ, you ought to what? Walk like Christ. This is one of the biggest problems I find in America today, in Western culture. Probably you encountered it as well. Everyone is a Christian and nobody is a Christian. I remember a few years ago, I was just coming to Fresno. It was probably eight or so years ago. Probably some of you heard the story. But I remember going uh, to one of the students' homes. And, and again, as I said, we made a, a habit of just starting meeting with students and going in their homes. And, and this guy, his parents were not coming to our church. And he was living in a trailer park. So I won't go in there. And he told me that his dad is a drug dealer. But I wasn't really sure what that entails. I've never done drugs, never been with drugs. So I get into this guy's trailer, big fellow. Three times my size. And when I get in there, I see that he was working on his uh, business. 
he was back and forth. He had a little waiter in there and little bags and all that. And I'm like, hey, sir, I'm so sorry to disturb you. He thought I'm there for, sell, for, for buying some from him. I'm like, no, I'm here to tell you I'm the pastor uh, that, that your son uh, the, a church, attends the church, uh, uh, our church. And I want to just know your son. I want to know you. And, and I want to tell you about Jesus. Can I tell him and take a minute from your time to tell you about Jesus? And he's like, oh, oh, I'm so glad you said that. So he goes in the back room. He comes to the Bible, and he says, hey, look at this. This is the day of my baptism, and I received this Bible. I'm a Christian too. This is where it was given to me. And it was a good church in town, at least it used to be a good church. And it's like, he, he looks at me, and he's like, brother, and he wants to hug me. And I said, no, 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 man, I'm, I'm not the, your brother. And he's like, oh, why not? I'm like, because what you're doing is not, it doesn't fit the Christian." Oh, you are one of those guys who judges people, aren't you? And I said, no, man, I'm just one of those guys who holds God's word as a mirror to you. And what you're doing, you're deceiving yourself. You're wearing the wrong t-shirt. You say that you're wearing the t-shirt that says Christ. You don't know what you're talking about, man. You're making a joke out of Christianity and your kids see this. Now he pulled up a gun and he told me to leave his house. And I did. Just because I heard that in America they actually shoot you if you don't leave their property. But it was sad to see this type of things. And since then I've discovered so many others. I encounter people like that. They say they are Christians but they don't live like Christ. Brother and sister, you say that you're a Christian. I say that I'm a Christian. If I come into your neighborhood and I ask your neighbors, would they know that you are different than them? Are we different than the Mormons and Muslims around us, who some of them are very moral, but they don't know Jesus, the true Jesus of the Bible? Are we Christ-like? That's what he says here. Maturity, a second way in which you can look at your life, involves doctrinal stability. Involves doctrinal stability. Listen to verse 14. As a result, we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. One of the things that COVID did is that it opened up the internet for all of us to see everything that's out there. And all of a sudden, we are starting following people on the internet more than we follow even our pastors. The question is, do you have the sermon how to know what those guys are saying? On what basis do you listen to who you listen to? Do you recognize when their doctrines that they are not according to God's word? Do you have the maturity to recognize that? That's what he says here. Don't be like children. Children are very gullible. You give them some candy and they're going to follow you. Is that how some, some of us are? I fear this. Unfortunately, Yes. And I see it even among Romanian uh, communities. There, there's new people on the internet out there that have a lot of followers. And you're like, who's listening to this stuff? People like you and I who don't know their Bibles. Maturity means doctrinal stability. Maturity also involves truth expressed in love, verse 15 and 16. But speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head even Christ, from whom the whole body being fitted held together by what every joint supplies according to the proper working of each individual causes the growth of the body for the building up itself in love. I always tell this, especially to younger people who are discovering new doctrine. And they're so excited. They're like, man, I never was taught this. I have to go and change the world. And I tell them, hey, one of the signs of maturity is love, patience, respect honor. You need to be thoughtful. You need to recognize that you haven't invented these things. And you have to recognize where people are coming from. You need to walk slowly with people. And people will consider what you're saying when they see gentleness and kindness and love. You heard the old saying, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you what? You care. Start loving on people. And once you love on people, then at one point they're going to ask you, hey, why, why are you doing this stuff? Because it seems like you're, 
you're different than others. Oh, let me tell you why. Here's this doctrine that I, I have observed in Scripture and brings more glory to Christ and less to me. One of the ways I, I recognized when I was in the seminary in, in the States, I went to Romania and then I went to the States of seminary, and one of the professors in the States, he said, hey, uh, one of the ways in which you recognize that you are on the right track theologically is the doctrines that you're learning should give more credit to God and make less of you. If you are learning more of that, where God becomes bigger and you become smaller, you're on the right track. Where are you theologically? Where are you with your love? Maturity involves truth expressed in love. And then he goes on into verses 20, 17 onward. And I don't have time to walk us through that. But it is, it's interesting that maturity, he says there, involves not only knowing things, but living things, living things out. In verse 17, he goes on to say, I affirm together with the Lord that you walk no longer just as the Gentiles also walk in the futility of their mind. And then at one point in verse 20, but you did not learn Christ in this way. If indeed you have heard him, have been taught in him, just as truth is in Jesus, you also, it says there, you lay aside the old self which is being corrupted in accordance with lusts of deceit, and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind. How do you do that? Put off the new self. Therefore, verse 25 Laying aside falsehood, speak truth to each other in love. Verse 26, be angry and yet do not sin. Do not let sun go down. You see, one of the marks of a Christian is that he starts working at his life. You start putting off the old self and put on Christ. I call it holy sweat. How are you doing, brother and sister, in your holy sweat? Are you fighting with the things in your life? Have you asked people in your life saying, hey, what are some of the actually things that I'm blind spotted? I don't see. Have you ever, won, especially here in L.A., I think you did. Have you ever drove on the road and, and you looked in your mirrors and all of a sudden you're swerving on your left or right and you hear someone honking at you and you look you're like shocked because you didn't see it. Why is it? Because there's a blind spot that you cannot see them. We all have those blind spots, don't we? But normally, what we learn to do is to just learn to, oh, this is who I am. I'm angry because we in Oltenia, we're very angry. Or Moldova, we get very angry soon. So that's who I am. That doesn't work, is it? That's what Christ says here through Paul. No, no, no. Brother, you're angry? It's good that you're aware of that? You need to work at it. Let's work at it. It's going to take some time because you didn't came, come to your anger overnight. It's going to take some time of counseling and you realizing, okay, what causes anger? You're going to see pride and, and wrong expectations, a, a very high view of self, a very low view of others, a very low view of the gospel. There's things you need to learn. You need to memorize. But don't stay like that. People just say, oh, this is how he is. You know him. He's just a grumpy man. Well, you know her. She's just a gossip. Sister, that's not a good thing. You need to be like Christ. I need to be like Christ. We need to be like Christ. And one of the things I found is that people don't like confrontation. They like to talk about that person with someone else. It's gossip. And we, we usually, what we do, we excuse it by being truth. I'm just speaking the truth. I'm just saying something about Doru to someone else, and it's true, you know. But I'm never going to brother Doru to tell him that because, oh, He's not going to change and not, no. Well, how about going first to him and try to talk about him or with him about truth instead of talking about Dora with someone else who's, when he's not present? That's what gossip is. Saying a truth about the person when that person is not present with someone who's not part of the solution. Slander is when you're saying an untruth about that person who's not there and you're talking with someone else who's also not part of the solution and you're lying to him. We would justify it. Well, this is who I am. I'm only speaking truth. Christ says we need to be different. We need to be different. I want to also mention one more passage, and I promise you I'll be done soon. Hebrews chapter 5. Paul talks to the, most likely Paul is the one who wrote this 
uh, epistle we don't know, someone close to him. Here's what he says in verse 11 and 12 to the end. Concerning him, we have much to say, and it is hard to explain, since you have become full of, dull of hearing. For though, he says, by this time you ought to be teachers, you have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God, and you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness, for he is an infant. But solid food is for the mature, who because of practice have their senses trained to discern good and evil. Now listen to verse 1, chapter 6. Therefore, leaving the elementary teaching about the, about the Christ, let us press us to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of instruction about washing and laying of hands and the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. Now what he's saying here is, Paul is rebuking these people, and he says in, in the one he writes the letter of Hebrews to. And he says, you guys are children in the faith. Now you might say, oh, that's a nice way to put it. No, we're just children. That's not actually a good thing. Because it's cute to see kids who are three or one or two or three with their little bottle in their hand and running around. You're like, oh, let's take a picture. What a sweet kid. Who is it? Oh, let's play with him. But when you see a, a person who's 30 or 40, or 50, with their bottle in their hand, you'd be like, uh-oh, we have a problem here. I don't know if prayer can change much with him, but let's, let's start with prayer, and then probably you should go to a doctor, because there's some problems there. Why is it that in our normal physical world, we don't entertain the idea that someone can be 30, 40, 50, and still behave like a child, and, and not, not let, the, let that person be like that without some help and hope, hoping that it can be increased. Why is it that in the spiritual world we're fine? Why is it? And if you, if you look here, like, okay, what is, it, what is it maturity, Andre? What is Paul saying that is maturity? He says here, for example, the foundation of, of the, or the milk is talking about, it says here, repentance from dead works and faith toward God. Interesting. That's basic Christianity. You need to know what does it look like to be justified by faith alone and not by works. That's basic. How are you doing with that? If I had to ask you, what's the difference between orthodoxy, Catholicism, and Christianity? Evangelicalism, Christianity. Evangelical Christianity. What would you say to them? What does it mean that you are not saved by works? Do you have a grasp of that gospel? That's, by the way, foundational. It goes on and says, an instruction of washing and laying on hands. What does that mean? The washing. What is washing of what? Well, he's talking here about this idea, this, this old uh, Jewish rituals in which you were washed through baptism. And in, in that sense, you were doing something towards salvation. That, that's what a lot of commentators think. And he says, no, 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 you have to get away from that, move from there. Then in laying of hands, what does that mean? You're calling people to service, to ordination. And then he goes on, and the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. What do you believe about the resurrection? Are you strong on this? I had in the last few weeks been pro having problems with my AC. And I'm not sure if you've done this, but I saw it firsthand. Where you call one guy, and we don't have many guys in our church that know. I found out later that there's some, but I didn't know at the beginning. So you just bring one guy in, and he looks at it, and he tells you, this is what's wrong with it. And you think, okay, here's some money, fix it. He comes back, no, it's not that. Then he brings some one other guy. And they're all trying to figure it out. Now, here's where I don't have trust in those guys. When they pull up YouTube, and they say, what's wrong with this type of AC? Then you'll be like, excuse me, sir, I could have done this. Actually, I've done the same thing. How many years have you been doing this? And if he says to me, 30 years, then I'll, I would be wise enough to say, to say, you know what? Thank you very much for your service, but I have someone else coming in. No, thank you. Why is that? Because you expect after 30 years of service, that guy, I just have to tell him the serious number, and he already tells me everything about it. No? 
you not expect anything less. Why? Because he matured in his job, in his profession. So if we expect this from this type of people who are working in all kinds of areas, why is it that in the Christian church, in the Christian body, in the Christian world, we have brothers and sisters who have been Christians for 20, 30, 40, 50 years, and they cannot tell you any foundational things about the Scriptures? If you ask them about the doctrine of justification, if you ask them about some church history, if you ask them about resurrection, they're like, brother, I don't like to read. I just don't know. That's mediocrity. And I find not only that we don't know, but we actually, when we have a young person or someone interested in church history, theology, oh, you're called to seminary. You need to get out from our midst because nobody other than seminary people are interested in this stuff. And my call to you, brothers and sisters, dear friends, is to start digging in God's Word. You are called to know God. You know why sometimes you live mediocre lives? Because we are mediocre in our approach to know God. You cannot love and serve someone you don't know. More you know God, more you let God just take control of your life as a Christian, in your day-to-day -day life. It doesn't mean you're going to be a preacher. It doesn't mean you're going to be a theologian. By the way, we're all theologians. We all have a knowledge of God. That's what the theology means. The question is, are you a good theologian or a poor theologian? We all have a knowledge of God. But we were taught, unfortunately, throughout the years, not necessarily with, with bad intention, but this is because we weren't challenged enough. We think, like, I'm just going to stay in my pew. And, and unless Father Daniel or someone asks me to do something, this is, this is their world. I'm just going to come on Sunday morning, get fed a little bit, and then watch my own business. And my call to you, my plea to you, dear brother and sister, is get into God's Word. Start studying God's Word. Start delighting in God's Word. Start allowing God's Word to shape your life. Start making decisions for your life according to God's Word. Start making decisions for your kids, your grandkids, your retirement, your work according to God's world, Word. Don't let the world around you dictate what you should live like. I feel like we, we say one thing on a Sunday morning, we sing one thing, one thing on a Sunday morning, but we live differently from Monday to Saturday. I'm not saying anything new to you. I'm just calling you to places and riches that you've never seen and you didn't think that they are actually attainable. We have a bunch of older people in our church. Now, I've been starting challenging them. and I, I, They came to me and said, Andre, I hear you. I'm not really good at reading. I'm not really good at that. Where should I start? And I said, hey, just start getting in the Bible studies. There's study Bibles you can buy. You can, we actually have study Bibles at church. I know you have here Sunday school. Start getting deep into that. Start putting effort into it. And start actually letting those things take shape. Start volunteering at a pregnancy care center. Start volunteering at places where you can inter you're interacting with non-believers. You're taught how to preach the gospel. I had several men who are in their 70s, and one of the guys who was in the 80s, and he said, Andre, until this last year, I never shared the gospel in my life with anyone. And he said, I thank you for pushing me to do it. I told the older guys, the Bible says, if you're an older woman, teach the younger women how to live for Christ, how to love their husbands, how to, to, to be Christ-like, how to be humble, how to take care of their home. Who's going to do that if not you? We are just few servants we are supposed to equip you, and we do that. But at the end of the day, you are called to do the work. Your church is as good as the members of his church are. If you're an older man, take some younger guys and say, hey, can we go to the Gospel of Mark, and we're just going to read verse by verse. I probably don't know as much as you know, young man, but I have white hair you don't have. And I can teach you things about God that probably you can never learn in a book. If you start doing those things, you'll see that you start to have, have impact in, your people's, in the people's lives around you, in your church. What these young men and women need is not a mega church, not a charismatic pastor. They need discipleship. What you need is encouragement in the faith so that we can all attain to the maturity of Christ. That's our goal. That's our heart.
That's my heart. You probably will forget about my day, day here, but I pray that you won't forget about my challenge. For seek, for, for, pursue Christ and focus on Him, delight in Him, and enjoy His Word. Let me pray. Father, I pray for this Word. I pray that You would um, bless it, Lord. I pray that You would really uh, encourage people to, to put it in their hearts and not only be convicted by it, but be transformed by it. We all want to be mature believers in Christ. Help us, Lord, for that. Thank you again for my brothers who are servants here. I know that they are working hard to be faithful pastors and teachers. And thank you, Lord, for their faithfulness in their life. Continue, Lord, to protect them, to strengthen them, to continue to equip their sheep to do your work. Lord, thank you for that. But Lord, I pray that each one of us realizes that it's our responsibility to grow in Christ. In Jesus' name we pray, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen.